I have to share a little personal story with you at this point because I told you of my mother's conversion on Friday night and how I was offended by the fact that these pastors came and laid hands on her and anointed her only because I didn't understand what was going on but my mother started to have Bible studies in our home and I was too proud to sit in the Bible studies but I sat on the other side of the wall and the wall was so thin I could hear everything. So I was listening very carefully to the Bible studies even though I wasn't a part of them. And I learned something that years later I was to prove and that was that it's a dangerous thing to hear the word of God. Because if you hear it, it has a habit of lodging in your mind. And one night my mother was having a Bible study on how to keep the Sabbath. And I was amazed as I discovered that the Sabbath began on Friday evening at sunset. I'd never heard of this. And it ended at Saturday evening at sunset. I said, what? But the thought lodged in my mind and began to germinate. I was going to night school two nights a week trying to keep up my education and I was coming home on the train every Friday night I took a train home I'd get off the train I'd turn left which I always did and I'd walk down past the local dance hall all of my friends were in the dance hall I'd been going there for years everybody was there drinking partying dancing it was a wild scene and about a quarter of a mile from the dance hall, the music was so loud you could hear it. So I'd be walking down the street and all of a sudden I'd hear the music and I'd feel myself getting into the groove already as I'm coming down the street and saying, wow, I'm ready, you know. This was my whole life. And Friday night was my big social night of the week because remember I was looking after a family of six kids and a dying mother until she was healed. Anyway... I, t I catch the train Friday morning to go to work and the trains are crowded in Melbourne, got a beautiful train system but the trains are crowded and you can't get a seat very often but this particular morning I found a seat so I grabbed it and sitting next to me is a very clean cut young man who turned around and offered me his hand and introduced himself as a Methodist preacher. I said, oh my goodness. We've had two pastors in our house, now I'm meeting a Methodist preacher. What is happening to me? <laughs> anyway, this guy was very friendly and we just started to chat and so I took a risk. I said, well, maybe I'll lay my big question on him. He is a preacher. So I said to him, would you mind if I ask you a question? He said, no, go ahead. I had no idea how strange it must have been to ask a Methodist preacher about keeping the Sabbath. It never struck me at the time that this is strange, but he's the one God gave me. I said, well, you know, I've just become convicted that the Bible Sabbath starts on Friday evening at sunset and it ends on Saturday evening at sunset. And I said, you know, I'm a pretty worldly guy and tonight, it's Friday, tonight is my big party night. I go to the local dance hall where there's much drinking and, and carrying on. And I said to him, uh, I'm wondering, is there a way where I can go past the dance hall and not go in? Because I don't believe I'm strong enough to do that. He said, well, it's a great question. You know, I admired this young man. I've never met him again, but he was such a godly guy. He never once said to me, have you thought about the fact you might have the wrong day or something? He never raised that issue with me at all. He could see that I was a serious and sincere seeker and he just accepted the question and handled it as best he could. So he said to me, um, I've got some profound wisdom for you about this. He said, Turn, and he turned in his little New Testament, I of course didn't have a Bible, he opened up his little New Testament and he turned to Romans 6. These are the two verses that he read me and they're with me to this day. Romans 6 and verse, first of all he read verse 13. All the tenses in this verse, by the way, in the original Greek are all in the continuous tense.
tense. So it literally reads, Do not continually go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but continually present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. The words were so big I couldn't understand anything that he was reading, but he was about to explain it to me. Then he went on down to verse 16. Who had the King James Version as I can hear it? Uh, okay, Nick, read it out for us, please, in, in that version, because there's a word in here that's very good. Thank you. In verse 16? 16, yes. Okay. This is verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? And the word that leapt out at me here, and he emphasized it, was the word yield. The modern word being surrender. Yield. So he began with verse 16. He said to me, so you're going to go into the dance hall and I said, I believe I'm going in. All I'm wondering is, is there a way for me not to go in? He said, yes, there is a way. He said, and it's coming out of verse 16 here. He said, you'll be tempted to struggle against it, but you'll probably not win that struggle because the victory over temptation does not come through struggle. Amen. First time I'd ever heard that. He said, because Jesus Christ in human flesh has already won that struggle. I thought, wow. I'm starting to hear the good news now. So he said, when you, you know, you're tempted to give in tonight, before you actually go in, find a quiet place. I said, well, there's a big tree in the front yard. He said, that's good. Go and stand under the big tree and look up. I said, remember, you're talking to somebody who's never prayed in his life. I wouldn't know what to say. He said, it's okay, I'll tell you what to say. He said, stand under the big tree and look up and yield. I said, I'm not getting it. He said, well, say to God at this moment, I need the mind of Jesus. Amen. And then finish your sentence with this, I give you permission to make this decision for me. He said, that's the meaning of yielding. You hand over the permission to God to make the decision for you. I said, what will happen? He said, you'll see. I still say it to this day, all these years later, I still say to God, I give you permission for this. So, Friday night, I took the train back. I turned left as I always did. I'm walking down the, the hill, I hear the music, I'm getting in the groove already, I can feel my legs moving. The music was great that night. There was a gate, I opened the gate and I walked into the yard in front of the dance hall. I saw the big tree, but it didn't register with me yet. And a young lady who knew me rather well came out of the dance hall. Oh, Bill, Bill, we've been waiting for you. So before I could say a word, she came over and took hold of me by the hand and started leading me into the dance hall. I've never been so frustrated in all my life because everything in me said, no, I don't want to go into the dance hall. But my legs were saying, yes, yes, as my mind was saying, no, no. And I followed her right up to the door of the dance hall. All my friends were in there. And I stopped dead at the doorway because the Holy Spirit went zap. You know what he brought into my mind? Romans 6.16 It was the only scripture I knew. To whom you yield yourself, his servants you are. I thought, oh my goodness, this is the moment that he was talking about. This young preacher who prayed with me on the train, he was a godly man. He said, at that moment of your greatest temptation, that's when you yield. So I said to this girl, look, there's something I've got to do. You go in, I'll be in shortly. And I went out and I stood under the tree and I looked up for the first time in my life. And I said to God, you know, this is a first for me and I'm sure God said, and me too, <laughs> with you. <laughs> Of course, I couldn't hear God at that point. 
And I said to God, you know, the preacher told me that if I ask you to make this decision, you could make it. So I'm giving you permission to make the decision as to whether I go into the dance hall or not. And in one moment of time, you've experienced it, my mind was so strengthened that I knew in one minute that I didn't have to go into the dance hall. I had the strength to turn around. So I started to turn around and walk away, but the devil wasn't going to let me go that easily. A dozen of my friends came out of the dance hall. Oh, Bill, what are you doing? Are you talking to a tree or what? I was so embarrassed, you know. I ran out of the dance hall and ran all the way home. But I praised God. I thought, wow, it worked. It really worked. Then to my great chagrin and disappointment, three weeks later, I was coming back down the same hill again. I heard the same music and guess what? I went in. Yes, I did. I was so disappointed with myself. I was so depressed really because here I thought I had it together and then I said, well, one thing I did not do, I didn't go and stand under the tree. I did not yield. I think I started to think maybe I'm strong enough already. What a fatal thing that is. Huh? And so that night I walked home very quietly and I said to God, I'm sorry I did this. I didn't want to do it. He basically said, I understand. Keep doing what you know is working. Anyway, that week, as I was catching the train and come, going to work and coming home again, I was reflecting on the fact that I had slipped back so quickly. I was so disappointed. And of course, my mother was praying fervently for me. She could see that the Spirit was convicting me. Anyway, I'm sitting in the train one morning and the thought jumped into my mind. I now know it was the Holy Spirit. But the thought jumped into my mind. You know what God said to me? Do you have to turn left? <laughs> How practical God is, you know. I thought, what, what do you mean? Do I have to turn left? Then I realised I'm turning left because it takes me past the dance hall. I could go straight ahead, I could go right. So the Holy Spirit said to me, try turning right. <laughs> So I started turning right and going home that way and I was nowhere near the dance hall. Anyway, a couple of years ago, my oldest son, who's a pastor in Southern California, he was in Melbourne with me. He said, Dad, he's always setting me up for something. He said, Dad, take me on the train out to where you used to live. I said, OK. I said, you're setting me up for something. I can feel it. So we took the train together. We got off the train. Now, my son said to me, now, Dad, empty your mind of all preconceived ideas. I said, yeah, yeah. And he said, walk through that gate and turn whichever way you feel most naturally inclined to turn. He's watching me carefully because he'd heard this story. So which way do you think I automatically turned? Of course, I turned right. Do you know why? I didn't understand it at the time until much later I began to understand what had happened here. I actually said to my son, I have forgotten the different streets involved in going left because I must have turned right so many times. You know those pathways in the mind? Those physical pathways? You can't erase them, but you can replace them. I must have turned right so many times that I had established a new pattern in my brain and I'd even forgot the streets involved in turning left. So I automatically turned right. And that's when the young Methodist preacher shared with me now verse 13. After we, he got me convinced about yielding, how important that was, 